I do want to go back to 1968. And it's not just about the assassination of Dr. King, but of course that is much of what we think about when we think about 68. But of course there's the war in Vietnam and the escalation there. Uh, Bobby died also. Uh, shortly after the announcement that we just saw, he made that announcement and then Robert Kennedy, our senator, was killed. Uh, King was opposing the war, uh, the Poor People's March, uh, and then our cities erupted in violence, uh, including New York City, uh, after the death of King, but also because of uh, the enduring poverty and disenfranchisement that King was working to end at the time of his assassination. So, so I want to, I guess, begin by asking, uh, well, I want to ask each of you. Okay. Uh, where you were when you heard Dr. King died. Uh, and then I want to ask you about how the work continued. A and then I, I, I want to come to you, Dr. Theo Harris, to talk about Coretta Scott King's work, because that's why we have you here. Because we always think of the widow as a grieving widow, but we often don't talk about how the work continued through the work of the wives who often are not celebrated in their own right. So, so Dr. Jones, uh, take us back to that moment uh, but I, I want to do it in a celebratory way because the work did continue and it needs to continue now. Well, first of all, and I will say something about uh, uh, that briefly, but I saw the, uh, the clip of that tragic time of Robert Kennedy in Gary, Indiana. And that was indeed a, a moving moment. In fact, in my judgment, is a moment that transformed him from the former Robert Kennedy, because let history, uh, you know, sometimes you can sanitize history. And it's, uh, it's the misfortune of the Kennedy legacy and the misfortune of some of you people here that I have lived so long. Because, no, no I want to tell you, that same Robert Kennedy, he was a magnificent, you understand? That same Robert Kennedy authorized uh, J. Edgar Hoover mm -hmm. to wiretap mm -hmm. the telephone conversations of Martin Luther King right. Jr. and I and Stanley Levison right. from um, uh, um, uh, June, uh, uh, July 13th to December 31st, 1967. Every single telephone conversation between Martin Luther King Jr. and myself, our home, Stanley Levison, and so forth, every single one was wiretapped, okay? And interestingly, when I went to visit um, uh, the former director, um, what's his name again? Um, Comey? James, James Comey, Comey, yes. Well, you know, I must be, it's all this medication I'm taking. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, no, I was, no, hold on. How quickly Three weeks, no, 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 no. You don't know, I'm, you know, I'm glad to be here. Three weeks ago, I was in the, ICU in Stanford University. And we so, we so okay, appreciate. No, three weeks ago, ICA on Christmas Eve and all that Christmas, but that, I'm just telling you, my brain is still working. But the point is, <laughs> no. <laughs> the point is, is that when I visited Comey, just him and I in his office, he took me over to his desk and underneath the, the glass top of his desk, he showed me the original copy of the memo from um, Robert Kennedy, uh, from, sorry, from J. Edgar Hoover, mm. requesting Robert Kennedy to authorize mm. the wiretap. Mm. And there is Robert Kennedy's signature authorizing it. Mm. Now, the reason he brought it over to me, he says, you know, Mr. Jones, every time there's a meeting of FBI agents in the office, I, brought, I bring them over to this so that they can see this and tell them this should never happen in our country today. Mm. Mm. Now, having said that, I should say, after the assassination of uh, 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 Martin King, in all historical respect, that began the second journey of Robert Kennedy. Mm. He was a different person for a whole combination of reasons. So, now, so where was I? Lord have mercy. I was, um, I was actually on my way to um, Memphis, Tennessee, mm. by prearrangement to go down and, and visit Martin, because we had talked to him, I talked to him the night before. And as I'm running out the door to go to, go to the airport, the phone rings. Mm. And I think to myself, oh, I don't want to answer the phone. And something tells me, go answer the phone. So I, I answer the phone, and it's Harry Belafonte. I said, Harry, I can't talk to you now. 
He said, what are you talking about? Martin's been shot. I said, what do you mean? I'm on my way to Memphis, Tennessee. Martin's been shot. Then turn on the television. So I turn on the television, and I look, and I said, oh, my God, that's all I could see. Martin Luther King's been assassinated, Memphis, Tennessee. So I'm figuring out, well, what, what am I going to do? So I, I, I mean, I, I call down to the numbers I had in Memphis, because there had been a prearranged agreement that I was going to come from the airport, and they're going to take me to where he was speak where he was speaking, and the lines were busy, and uh, I couldn't get through. Next thing I know, the phone rings again. It's Harry. He says, "You still have your television on?" I said, "Yeah." So I looked at it, and they said, "Martin Luther King Jr. is it's dead." The first thought that came into my mind in the first 15 seconds was they finally got him. I said they finally got him. I met Martin Luther King Jr. February 1960 when I was 29 and he was 31. And for the next seven and a half years, there soon came a time when I knew it was just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Just a matter of time because that was the baddest, baddest brother. And I heard, some, I heard people talk about how bad this person was. Let me tell you something. That was the baddest brother walking the earth. Mm. Okay. No, 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 let me tell you, he, he, he was a Baptist minister, and, and, and he used to say, there's nothing you can do to protect me. You know why? Because he believed that only his Lord Jesus Christ could protect him. He believed deeply. He says, nothing you, Clarence, Stanley Levison, or anybody else, work with, you forget about it. Only my Lord can protect me. Now, he was fearful, but he was fearless. That's the difference. And I hear all these people who talk about how bad they could be and so forth, and you know, they're gonna do, man, put the, put the, kick up the white man's ass and all that, excuse me, <laughs> let me tell you something. You know how bad that brother was? And people like Fannie Lou Hamer and James Orange and mm. Anita Boynton, mm. okay? You know how bad they were? With 200, with, with state troopers, 220 pounds, uh, you know, pot bellies going over that thing, and hat and pistols, mm. okay? They would say, we're going down to register to vote. And he would get down and kneel uh, uh, before and leading a march. And he didn't care about all this on might and power because mm. he was going to do what he was going to do. Yeah. And he was going to do what he was going to do because he believed in the power and protection of his Lord Jesus Christ, mm. in his words. And he believed in the goodness of America. Yeah. And I don't want to take too much time. And I, and I, and I, I you know, I came all the way here from Palo Alto, California, so you got to give me some break. You know? Yeah, now, and now, doctor, doctor, you we appreciate that flight. Yeah, give me some break. It's, it's warm. It's cold as hell here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> doctor, I am good. Doctor, I am going to No, 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 it's, it's warm, so you've got to thank doctor, me for even coming here. Doctor, you know? I thank you for coming. <laughs> I thank you for coming, and, and I promise you, you're going to get more. You're going to get more time. I'm sorry. With I'm gonna Dr. Clarence Jones, because he's going to have his own panel, his own panel, no, in I'm just sorry. a few I'm minutes. Keep quiet. I'm keep uh, quiet. So we're going to bring you back. I'm sorry. Um, but I do want to. I want to come over to Taylor Branch, and I want to follow up on what Dr. Jones said, uh, because there were so many factions in the movement. We had. Uh, of course, Dr. King's organization, SCLC. We had the Student Nonviolent uh, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was an outgrowth of that. We had, of course, NAACP. I could go on, and I don't have time to go on. Once Dr. King died, did those groups coalesce, or was there? Did they devolve into greater divisiveness? What happened, especially in terms of the Poor People's Campaign, but but in terms of all of his causes? Uh, was this a motivating factor and they came together? Or uh, did, did it start to crumble? Was this the beginning of a, 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 a devolution in the movement? I think people, first of all, thank you for having me here. Of course. Thanks for being with Clarence <laughs> and Jean. Thank you for being here. Uh, second, I was with my mother when we heard that Dr. King was mm. killed. That's another story. I won't get into that. But we, we, we have to be truthful and honest about what that moment meant in Memphis. The movement was already coming apart. Even SCLC didn't stay together. Even his own organization couldn't stay together. But a lot of the movement organizations had already splintered. 
Um, Dr. King was not at the forefront of American consciousness at the time he was killed. That's another story. Um, having said that, the, the momentum that that movement set in train engendered what he called the widest liberation in human history, not just in the United States, but around the world, the freedom, the freedom movement. And it liberated senior citizens and women and the white South uh, and, and African Americans in many respects in the United States. To me, the key question is, why, if, if the freedom movement generated these blessings for so many groups in America, why do we live in a cynical age about the prospect of politics? And it's because we don't understand that that movement, the measure of American commitment to the equal citizenship and we the people has always been race. At the few times that we've taken it seriously, we've leapt forward. But for the last 50 years, we've, our discourse has been in denial about how central this is to democratic promise. We're our, not having an honest conversation. We're, not about having, we're, running, we're running from it. There, there are sadly a lot of people, if asked to choose in a pinch between their prejudices and, and, and the American Constitution, would take their prejudices. Uh, that's where we are. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, that our involvement, if you care about American democracy, you should be talking about race. If you care about race, you should be plumbing the American um, experiment for, for, for weapons. That's what Dr. King did. He always put one foot in the scripture and one foot in the Constitution. And, and, he, and he built an incredibly broad movement. And that, to me, is the tragedy that we've been in denial of the promise of that movement, even when we're harvesting all the blessing. I mean, one tiny thing. The year after Dr. King died, the national championship college football team from the University of Texas had a roster of 85 white players and no black players. Even college sports were still segregated mm -hmm, right. at that time. And women couldn't go to Harvard, Yale, you know, all these things have changed. We accept those blessings. We don't ask where they came from. They came from because the, the racially led civil rights movement forced us to say, what do we really mean by equal citizenship? And we have forgotten that challenge or dodged it because people don't want to acknowledge a black led movement as a model of, of, of modern political leadership. Dr. Theo Harris, I do want to ask you about Coretta Scott King, because as I indicated, we always think about the grieving a widow. Uh, when we, of course, think of Merle Evers, we think of that. I think Coretta Scott King is the archetypical grieving widow, but, but that's uh, unfair, isn't it? I mean, she had not only the work that she believed in, uh, in and of herself, but also continued the work of Dr. King. Tell us a little bit about what happened in the immediate aftermath of his assassination and the years thereafter. Um, thank you. And I just to say, it is such an honor. I can't quite believe I'm here at the <laughs> Apollo. I feel like I need to say that. Um, so yeah, I think we've trapped her. There's that iconic picture of Coretta Scott King, right? Veiled, all in black, stoic. And I think we've trapped her be behind that veil and we haven't seen her, right? She is political before she meets him. Part of why they fall in love mm. is because of that shared politics. In many ways, her kind of global vision, her peace vision moves him. Um, he will talk in the mid-60s. She's out against the war in Vietnam publicly, in large measure before him. A reporter asks him, after she gives a speech, did you educate her? He says, no, she educated me. Mm. Um, And she, I mean, she shows a staggering fortitude, I think, um, mm. because four days later, she goes and leads the march in Memphis that he was supposed to lead. And then she picks up, right, so many strands of the movement. So it is her and many comrades across the country who take up the work of the Poor People's Campaign that spring. They go to DC, right, to make poverty visible and to make it impossible to ignore poor people in this country. Right? She is working on sort of 
and helping to sew kind of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement further together and echoing what Mr. Jones was talking about, the FBI is, you know, increases their surveillance of her in the aftermath of his assassination because of her kind of power and leadership, right? So in many ways, there's something embarrassing about how the FBI in 1969 is taking her leadership more seriously than we do today. And as Dr. Jones indicated, they lived with that threat of death they did. They throughout did. the course of their marriage until his assassination, which means she too she, was living in fear, although with fortitude. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. She has four young kids. Um, many people talk about her being one of the reasons we have a Gary Convention in 1972, a national black convention. Um, she takes sort of the movement for global justice forward around um, the divestment movement. She's out against the second Gulf War. I mean, she is sort of incredibly, in the 1970s, she says to a friend, I wish I could get more than four hours of sleep a night. I mean, she is everywhere. And I think she is a reminder, right, that the movement doesn't die, right? The movement is not over even despite the tragedy that is Dr. King's assassination. And the movement is big, right? It's big, it's about voting rights, it's about anti-poverty, it's about sort of anti-imperialism, it's about criminal justice. And I think you, you, when you watch Coretta Scott King, you see that and you, it gets us past the kind of just sitting in our feelings to sort of the movement carrying forward. Taylor Branch, I have to ask you this question, although I ask it reservedly knowing and having read your books. Uh, we're going to hear from Black Lives Matter in a bit. Uh, so 50 years after Dr. King's death and the movement that he led and was so much a part of, is there a danger in lionizing the icons you notice, I, I'm, I'm, I, get ready, because when you come back out here, with, I'm going to ask you this question, I too. Know what you're <laughs> Is there a danger in lionizing the icons of the movement? Uh, and does it hold us back and keep us from moving forward where we need to go today? Well, there's always a danger if you try to fight the next movement by the rules and the heroes of the last movement. You've got you've to move forward. But right now, I don't think that we fully appreciate the power of that previous movement in order to begin um, getting out from where we are now, which is, which is why do we have such, why do we have Trump in the White House, for God's sake? Uh, you know, why, how, did, how did we sink this far um, to, to not be able to talk about the constitutional promise and deal with race uh, as, as the heart of, uh, of the failed promise. We have this burden of race and we don't have the courage to lift it again to restore. That's what the movement did. I, I, I'd say that um, Black Lives Matter and a lot of the, the dreamers, uh, they're, they're beginning movements, but they haven't come together in their own way, not the way that we would prescribe, uh, to move the country the way that movement did before and, and influence the whole world and, and other people. So I'm hoping that we're at the end of, of a cycle where the Trump cycle has finally gone splat and, and, uh, and we will finally realize that, that we need to take responsibility for st restoring the hope of freedom. Dr. Jones, how do we build the bridge from well, the movement say, of okay. then to the people today who want to leave new move, lead new movements now to the future? Um, I think the Black Lives Matter movement and um, Reverend William Barber II, the moral majority the movement, they are the day's most relevant template, in my judgment, of carrying forward the legacy of Martin Luther King, Jr. Now, they, uh, they, um, they have some uh, uh, areas to grow in, but basically they've, they've captured the soul and content. Now, you know, this, uh, this, this program has captured Martin Luther King Jr., a dream deferred. And I, you know, I heard earlier, you know what happens to a dream deferred, dries up like a raisin in the sun, quoting uh, Langston Hughes' uh, poem. And uh, what we have to be concerned today 
as, as I've said, we have to avoid, we have to be careful uh, that we don't trivialize and uh, what I call minstrelize <laughs> the legacy of this extraordinary man. Uh, yeah, everybody talks about the dream. Now, the dream was uh, really was an effort. It was, as, it was an aspirational example, holding up as an example uh, to America what it could be. Um, but the essence of the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> is Memphis, Tennessee, and those garbage workers. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. That's his essence. Mm -hmm. it, ain't, it ain't the dream. It's, it's, he was about the least of these. Mm -hmm. He was about the poor. And um, uh, the celebrated speech, for example, that he gave opposing the war in Vietnam was yes, he opposed the war in Vietnam because in terms of violence and so forth. But the basic, one of the basic reasons he opposed it is that the brother could count, you know? He knew that there was no way, notwithstanding anything that Johnson said, that there was gonna be anything left to, for, the, for the war in poverty because mm -hmm. all the money was being spent in pursuit of the war, you understand? Now his legacy, I wanna go back. To, to be Doctor, we're going to have we're going to okay. we're going to bring Dr. Jones back out in just a few minutes, and we're going to drill down okay. on the writing that Dr. Jones did with Dr. King okay. specifically. Uh, and, and also, I do want to let you know that Sisters Upstown Bookstore and Cafe will be selling books by Dr. Jean Theo Harris and Taylor Bo Branch and Patrice Colors, Black Lives Matter. Uh, and you're going to be able to access those books as you leave this afternoon. Uh, Brian Lehrer and I will be talking in greater detail with you, Dr. Jones, about the speeches. Okay, because so, I got more to say. Because uh, I know you do. I know you do. I'm not in finished. fact, I may just let him come on out and Brian no, and not, I don't no, even I'm have to finished. sit down want, here. We'll just fly, send him no, on no, out in his jacket. Don't fly me all this. No, no, I'm not, I will not participate <laughs> in no sanitization or ro ro romanization of Martin Luther King Jr. Don't do We're that gonna to me. We're going to bring you back out in just a few minutes oh, yeah. and it'll be just you. All right, but in the meantime, I want you to join me in thanking Dr. Jones, as well as Dr. Jean Theo Harris and Taylor Branch, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.